Chapter 4 I had always thought it would be fun to have a brother or sister. That is, until I spent a few months living in my little apartment with five other kids. The bickering, the fighting, the whining. You'd think that soldiers in the streets and synagogues burning and days with nothing more to eat than moldy potatoes would be more important than who got to play with what doll or who got to sleep with by the window. But you would be wrong. The nights are the worst. I pulled my pillow and blanket out into the hall where Rosenblum girls were arguing, which seems like all the time now. I had to sleep on the floor, but I didn't mind so much. I would be sleeping on the floor here or there, and at least for now I had the whole hall to myself. If we had to take in another family, I thought bitterly, I'd probably share the hall too. I was sound asleep one night when a creak in the hall woke me up. In the darkness, I saw the shape of a person. Who's there? I asked, feeling my heart in my throat. Shh, Yannick, it's me, my father whispered. I'm sorry I woke you. Go back to sleep. Father had his coat on. He was going outside. Where are you going? I asked him. I want to go with you. No, it's dangerous to be out after curfew. And why are you going? I was scared. I scrambled out from under my blanket. Going to leave the ghetto? Anyone caught trying to escape the ghetto was shot on sight. No, no, go back to sleep, Yannick. No, I wanted to help. My father had begun to look so tired lately. The work gangs and the lack of food made him look like he'd aged 10 years in just two. I can help your eyes. I can look out for guards. I want to come with you. Yannick, you'll wake everyone else, my father sighed. All right, but not another word. We must be silent. You understand? I nodded and hurried to put on my coat. When I was ready, we slipped out the door and down the stairs. I had never been this late before. The stairwell was dark and full of shadows. My heart was still my heart still leapt at every little sound, even with my father there. My father led me down the stairs like we were going to the building's furnace in the basement, but instead we went through the back door into the alley behind our building. Snow fell in big thick flakes muffling everything. It was so quiet you could hear the snowflakes hitting this you could hear the flakes hitting the snow that was already on the ground. Tick, 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 tick. I followed my father through the silent alley. Our footprints left tracks in untrodden snow. I looked behind me, suddenly worried that we were leaving a trail that would be easy to follow. But the falling snow was already covering our tracks. I prayed for more of it, even though more would just mean new work details, for my father and other Jewish men to clear it in the morning. We had to, uh, we had to cross at Joseph Inks uh, Street, which meant we would be out in the open. Down the block, a German soldier in a great coat, scarf, and hat cupped his hands to light a cigarette. My father put a hand to my chest, and we flattened ourselves against the wall in the shadow of the apartment building. I watched the German soldier breathe out a long cloud of smoke. The red ember of a cigarette glowed in the darkness. Where was he from? What was his name? Did he have any family? Children? Like me? Did he hate Jews the way that Hitler did? Had he ever killed a man? The Nazi rubbed his hands together, stomped his feet to clear the snow and cold from them, and walked around the corner out of sight. Now, my father whispered, so we hurried across the street, our feet crunching so loudly in the quiet night air, I thought everyone on the block must hear us. I'd crossed the street a hundred times, a thousand times, but it had never felt so wide. The other side so far away. When we reached the alley across the street, we stopped leaning against a wall while we caught our breaths and listened to see if anyone had heard us. The only sound we heard was the falling of the snow. Tick, 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 tick. My father led me on a short way, and I began to realize where we were going. Uncle Abraham's bakery! The Nazis had let him keep it to bake bread for soldiers. As we pushed on the door to go inside, something caught. A towel was stuffed into the crack along the floor. As soon as we were inside, I understood why. Bread. The wonderful, beautiful smell of bread. The aroma alone made my stomach growl. I had learned to live with hunger, but now that my body knew there was fresh, fresh baked bread to be had, it could barely contain itself. I shook with anticipation. My father replaced the towel under the door, and we made our way down the dark corridor to the ovens. Uncle Abraham and Aunt Fila had covered every window and door with towels, sheets, blankets, anything that would block out the light and the smell. Oscar, Uncle Abraham said to my dad when we found them. He hugged my father and I ran to where Aunt Fila was pulling racks of bread from the oven. 
And I see you brought a helper, Aunt Fila said. Hello, Yannick. She smiled at me, but I only had eyes for bread. Golden brown loaves that glistened and steamed in the cool air. I felt my mouth water. Fila jacked, or laughed. Take one. After work, my father said, and I heard for after we work, my father said, and my heart burst. How could I possibly wait? He turned to my uncle. What can we do? Are you firing both ovens? My father asked. Only one for bread, Uncle Abraham said, and he opened the second oven to show it was empty. In this one, we're burning wet wood to help cover the smell of bread with the smoke. We weren't able to save enough flour to bake in both ovens all the time anyways. I must make it last. Another month? Another two? Another year? Spring, my father said. The British and the French will be here by then. Uncle Abraham shrugged. Maybe the Russians that get here first, the peace can't last. Seventeen days after Germany had invaded Poland from the west, the Soviet Union had invaded from the east. Poland was split right down the middle, and the Germans and the Russians had promised not to fight each other. For now. In the meantime, we'll bake what we can. But if the Nazis find out, come, let's get to it, my father said. Yannick and I will feed the fires. We worked into the wee hours of the morning, father and I feeding wood and coal into the ovens, Uncle Abraham making the dough, Aunt Fila putting those delectable loaves from the racks and putting them in sacks. We must get you back before light, Uncle Abraham said at last. Here, take three sacks apiece. That should be enough to sell on Krakusa Street, plus one sack for yourself. A whole sack of bread just for us? I almost moaned at the thought of such a feast. Moshi's coming by tomorrow to pick up sacks to sell to the families on Wakirska Street, Abraham said, and Dawid and Salah tomorrow night to sell to Rekawa Street. How much per loaf? Father asked. Abraham shrugged. Fifty zloty, perhaps? Five zloty? A loaf of bread usually costs more than half a zloty. I hate to be so mercenary, but the price of flour has gone up too. You can still buy flour? Father asked. There are boys who have already found holes in the wall, ways to get out. They can buy things on the other side for a price, Aunt Fila said. These new Jews, they have more money too. They can afford it, Abraham said. Now go before it's light. Enjoy your bread, Yannick, Aunt Fila said. She kissed my forehead and Abraham's and my mother hugged each other goodbye. After we left, it was still dark outside and still snowing. There would be more patrols and the ghetto would soon be waking. There was no time to waste. One more than Yannick to come home, and then we shall have fresh bread for breakfast. How does that sound? Delicious, I said. Father had put a hand on my shoulder and squeezed it. We just have to survive the winter, Yannick, and then everything will be better. You'll see. I still worried he was wrong, but fresh bread made me forget all my troubles. For a little while, at least. Chapter 5 1942 came, but the British didn't, nor did the French. They were too busy fighting the Germans in the West. The radio talked about the fighting in Denmark and Norway and Belgium and the Netherlands, but since it was a German station, they always said that they were winning. Uncle Moshi said we couldn't trust anything that we heard, but he listened to any every word anyway, just like the rest of us. All I cared about was getting out of our crowded house for some freedom and fresh air, but my parents were still worried I'd be snatched up by the Nazis. The snow was still thick on the ground, with more snow falling every day, and the Jews were put to work shoveling it off of the streets. The Nazis also took the Jews away to work in Krakow factories. Some of the truckloads of Jews never came back, but nobody knew what happened to them. My parents didn't want to take any chances one way or another, so I had to stay in our building at all times. I took my ball into the hallway outside our apartment and practiced kicking it against the wall until me and old Mrs. Immerglick, across the hall, came out to yell at me to stop. I was just about to go downstairs to the basement to play when I heard a scream from one of the lower floors. Then, footsteps, lots of footsteps, a door smashing, more screams. I ran back inside our flat. Mama, Mama, I called to my mother. Something is happening in the building. Everyone staying in our apartment came together in the sitting room. We listened as the screams and crashes grew closer. I felt sick. I wish my father were there with us, but he had gone out to stand in line for our vegetable rations. Thump, thump, thump. Someone pounded on our door and we all jumped. Open up on authority of the ju ju gender knot. Everyone looked to my mother. It was our flat, after all. 
but she just watched the door with big round eyes. My heart was racing. What should we do? What could we do? Mama, I said, thump, thump, thump. Open the door or we'll break it down, said another voice, this time in German, a Nazi. Mama, I said, if we don't open up, they'll shoot us. My mother stared at the door. None of the other parents made a move. I had to do something. I hurried to the door and unlocked it, and a German officer and the genderat police officer pushed past me down the hall. The gen the Junderat were the Jews the Nazis put in charge of the ghetto, and they had special police officers who had to take orders from the Nazis. When we tell you to open a door, open the door, the German officer told the adults. The family huddled together, hugging one another, one another tight. Do you have jewels? Gold? A radio? he demanded. My mother did not answer. She just stared at the Nazi and trembled. He was getting madder, and I could tell. The officer took a step towards my mother, and I spoke up. In the kitchen, I said. The German turned to look at me with his cold blue eyes, and then nodded to the Jewish policeman who carried a sack. Your valuables, the officer said, now, or you will be, all be taken away. Someone screamed across the hall. Old Mrs. Immerglick and her family were being dragged away by the German soldiers. Her son, a man my father's age, had blood running down his forehead. Give it to them, I yelled. Give them anything they want. The other families in our flat scrambled to give the Nazi officer everything they had squirreled away. Little bits of jewelry, a pocket watch, a handful of slotty. The member of the Judernaut came out of our kitchen with his sack stuffed more than just a radio and went into the bedrooms looking for anything more of value. The German officer pulled the necklace from my mother's neck and twisted her wedding ring from her finger. She flinched when he did it, but she didn't say a word. This flat can stay, the German officer said, pocketing my mother's jewelry. But next time, open the door more quickly or we will send you to the east with the rest. Yes, sir, we will, sir, I said. The two men left and we all stood, frozen, listening to the shouts and sobs above us and below us. Out on the streets, two big gray military trucks pulled up and Jews from our apartment building and all the buildings around us were herded into them by German soldiers. They carried nothing with them. No suitcases, no extra clothes, no food, no personal belongings. Wherever they were going, they would have to do without. Something clattered in the hall outside. The doors to our flat and the Immerglick's apartment were still open. I could see an overturned table and lamp in their flat, but nothing more. Why had the Immerglicks and the families living with them been taken, and we hadn't? The officer said it was because we gave them our values, but the Immerglicks had a radio and jewelry and Zloty just like us. The Germans had taken Immerglicks for no reason other than they felt like it. A shot rang out in the street, and we all jumped again. Yannick, Mr. Rosenblum whispered, the door... I glanced at my mother, but she was a million miles away. Her eyes were focused on a rug at our feet, her face empty of emotion. I don't know if she had even heard the shot. I tiptoed down the entrance hall and closed the door, flipping the lock with a click. It didn't make me feel any safer. When the trucks in the street were full, they pulled away. We never heard where they went. My father could have been on one of them, for all I knew. My mother sat at the table, her mind still elsewhere. At this time of day, she... She would usually be in the kitchen preparing whatever rations we had for lunch, but there was no use now. Our cupboards had been cleared out in the raid. There was nothing to eat. The other families retreated to their rooms to see what had been taken and what was left. The Rosenblum girls waited like they were told to, uh, like they were trying to outdo each other in volume, so I slipped out into the hall. The door to the Immerglick's flat was still open, and someone was inside. It was Mr. Tatarka from down the hall. When he heard the click of the door behind me, he whirled. One of the Immerglick's nice cushioned sitting room chairs with his hands. He opened his mouth to say something, got flustered, and then hurried past me. He took the chair with him. I walked the hallway on my floor, looking in the empty rooms. Four flats, 16 families, all gone. Only two had their doors shut, us and the Tartarkas. Five flats were empty on the floor above us but only three on the top floor. Maybe the Germans got tired of walking up all those steps. I went back to the stairs and realized for the first time that there was another set of stairs going up, even though this was the top floor. I never had any friends on the top floor, so I'd only gone up once or twice in the past to run an errand. I sat down at this stairwell, 
listening for a new invasion of Germans, but everything was quiet and still. I climbed the extra flight of stairs. There was a big steel door at the top. I opened it and cracked and looked inside. The roof. This door led out onto the roof? How had I not known this was here? But then, even if I had known, my parents would never have let me come up here. Not in the past, when things like bedtimes and homework and safe places to play had been important. None of that mattered now. And I pushed my way outside and stood on the roof of our building. It was flat and covered with gravel. Pipes and conduits stuck, stuck, up, of, stuck up out of the roof here and there. The roof's edges, a little more than half a meter all the way around, were plastered with black tar. Strangest of all was a small wooden shack built up against the big brick chimney. It had a thin wooden door, and when I went inside, I found heaps of garbage and feathers and bird droppings. A pigeon coop. Mr. Emmerglick's pigeon coop, probably. When I was a little boy, all I knew about this old man who lived across the hall was that he loved pigeons, but I had never imagined he kept a coop on the roof. The pigeons were all gone now, just like Mr. Immerglick. He died a year before the Nazis came with the shack on his roof. If it was repaired a little, cleaned up, maybe had some electricity running to it from power lines that came into the building, my mind was racing. I ran back downstairs as fast as I could and burst into my flat. Mama, I cried. I found my mother in the kitchen, hugging my father. He was alive. He broke away from her when I came running in, worried. What is it, Yannick? He asked. Are they coming back? No, no, I want to show you something I found. Come quick. My parents followed me upstairs, walking when I wanted them to run. Finally, I pulled them out onto the roof and showed them the pigeon coop. Don't you see? With a little work, we could live here. Leave our flat? Father asked. Just the three of us, I told him. It's so crowded downstairs. Here we can have a space all to ourselves. We can scrub the floor and walls and clean it up. And we can wire a light and a light from my projector and a hot plate for cooking on. There's no bathroom, but we can always go back downstairs for that. And in the winter, we'll have the chimney to keep us warm. I don't know, Yannick, my father said. My mother hadn't come inside the coop. Instead, she just stood outside, staring back at the big steel door that opened to the roof. We can bring up chairs, my father, I told my father, and a mattress and bars, my mother said. It was the first thing I'd heard her say since the Nazis burst into our flat. Can you put bars on the door? She stared at it, but I could tell that her thoughts were still downstairs, reliving the invasion of our home. My father came out of the coop and put his arm around my mother's shoulders. Yes, Mina, we will fix up the coop and live here, and we will put bars on the door. Yannick and I will see to it. We gave our flat to the Rosenblums. The Bratmans were already moving across into the glimmer in Immerglick's apartment across the hall. The empty flat in our building would soon be overflowing with families as more Jews were marched in through the gates. But for a short time, at least, we would all live like normal people again. While my father was and I worked to clean the coop, my mother sat on the roof and sewed hidden pockets into the lining of our coats. Inside them, she hid all the money and valuables we had left. She never said another word, though, all that day. My father and I found our four heavy steel bars in the basement. By sundown, we, listed, we lifted the last of them onto the door of the roof. They slid into place so we could take them off to go out, but so that no one from inside the stairs could push through. There, I told my mother, no one will be able to break in ever again.